This lecture is on uh, nanomaterials or nanotechnology and uh, information technology. As in uh, earlier lectures, we would like to discuss the importance of effect of technology on environment and ecology and why the principle or concept of sustainable uh, sustainability becomes important. Nanotechnology is um, our science and engineering and technology conducted at very small scales or nano scales which are 1 to uh, 100 uh, nanometers. Its design, characterization and application of structures, devices and systems by controlled manipulation of size and shape of materials at the nanometer scale that is atomic, molecular and macromolecular scale. Let us look at the scales now. A nanometer is 1000 millionth of a meter or 10 to the power of 9 meters. For example, grain of sand it is of the order of 1 mm size. Diameter of human hair is 150 micrometers, whereas red blood cells are of the size 10 micrometer. Proteins are 10 nanometers. Diameter of DNA is about 1 nanometer and atom the size is about 0.1 nanometer. So, this is just to give you an idea about what are the scales that we are talking about when it comes to nanotechnology. So, uh, nanomaterials are materials with nanoparticles which are smaller than 100 nanometers in at least one dimension. The importance of this size is in terms of the properties. At nano scale, physical and chemical properties of materials differ very significantly from those at a larger scale and this is what is made use of in developing technologies at the nano scale. Because at such smaller scales, we will have increased interaction and reactivity of the material. So, one can use less material, potentially use less material to achieve the same goal as you would achieve with materials at larger sizes. That is the advantage of nano, nanotechnology. forms for example, crystalline here we show a self assembled arrays and meso crystal formed by the cubic iron oxide nanoparticles. These are the pictures of scanning electron or pictures taken by scanning electron microscope. This one is taken by reflected light microscopy. This is this picture here is taken using atomic force microscope and these are the temp pictures, these are nano crystals. We also get nano powder which is an agglomerate of ultra fine particles, these are nano particles or nano crystals. Here we show the micro photos of zinc oxide nano powder Z and O. We get nanotubes which are a sequence of nano scale atoms arranged in a long thin cylindrical structure. There is a long thin cylindrical structure here. They are very strong, they are extremely strong mechanically. They are pure conductors of current and they are very much used in resistors, capacitors, 
inductors, diodes, transistors, etc. So, we get this nano materials in different forms. We have one dimensional nano materials which are layers and multi layers and thin films. They are very much used in electronics industry. We also have two dimensional nano materials which are nano wires and nano fibers and then of course, three dimensional nano materials which are nothing but nano particles. In recent years, many tools have become available for examining the properties at nanoscales by probing atoms and molecules with great precision. Because of that, the nanotechnology has been uh, is being utilized in many, many situations in engineering. As I was mentioning, there are varied applications in medicine, nanotechnology can be used for diagnostics, drug delivery etcetera. In IT or information and communication, they are used for making semiconductor devices, quantum computers. They are also useful in heavy industries such as aerospace, construction vehicles etcetera and they find application in consumer goods like textiles, cosmetics etcetera. In environmental engineering, nanotechnology finds lot of applications. Nanotechnology can be used for carbon capture and reduce the GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. It can be used for making sensors which can detect the water quality or wastewater quality. Nanotechnology can be used for decontamination of oil spills, can be used in wastewater treatment. Nano sensors can be used for detecting metals and biological agents. Nanotechnology can be used for making biocides, removal of biofilm and a lot of applications are coming up these days utilizing nanotechnology for water purification which is very important in these days when we are finding lot of contaminants in water and then we need to remove them. So, nano filtration is a big thing in terms of water purification. Now, what are the implications, environmental implications? In fact, nanotechnology is like a double edged knife that I am showing here. The small size enables, I mean it is an enabling characteristic because it is increasing reactivity as I mentioned earlier, but the small size also increases the risk. There is more potential for material with such small scales, nano scaled or nanoparticles, they can get transported much more easily and they can get absorbed. We are utilizing the characteristics of higher react reactivity of nanoparticles for developing the technology. The same thing can work against us when these nanoparticles get into the environment, they may react with environment in a way that we do not want. So, it is a double edged knife. So, we need to do a the risk assessment of these nanoparticles getting into our environment. We need to have knowledge of their distribution, how they get transported, I mean nanoparticles which get introduced into the atmosphere or into the environment at one particular location, they do not stay there they have mobility. In fact, they have increased mobility. They move from one location to another location, they get transported. So, we need to have a knowledge on how they get transported and as they are getting transported, how they are reacting with the environment. 
that knowledge we need to have to do the risk assessment of this nanotechnology. The main problem is there is lot of uncertainty, we do not know much, there is an uncertainty in the relationship between surface reactivity and surface area that itself is not completely understood. So, since it is not completely understood, it adds complexity in terms of assessing the risk, in terms of understanding the effect of nanoparticles on environment. Lot of work is being carried out in this area. It has been found that skin, lungs and gastrointestinal tracts, they are the most likely points of entry for natural and anthropogenic nanoparticles into the bodies of animals and humans. Of course, they may get injected or they may get implanted, they are the other possible routes of exposure. Nanoparticles can translocate from these entry points or entry portals into the circulatory and lymphatic systems and eventually or ultimately they may find their way to body tissues and organs and that may have a detrimental effect. It is suspected that they can produce irreversible damage to cells by oxidative stress and or organelle injury. Here we show a picture which I have taken from a paper published by Christina Buzia and others in 2007. It shows the entry points for nanoparticles into the human body like nanoparticles can get ingested here or nanoparticles can get inhaled or you may have orthopedic implants or they can enter through the skin and once they enter into the body, they can get into lymphatic system or from the lungs, they can get into circulatory system, then they can go to the heart and other organs and then they can get into gastrointestinal systems as they are ingested. They find their way to all parts of the body and what are the effects? If they get in large quantities in gastrointestinal system, they can cause colon cancer, can cause when they get to the brain, they may cause neurological diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's or dementia. When they get to the lungs, they may cause bronchitis and other problems. If they are there through skin or implants, they may result in dermatitis. In lymphatic system, they cause Kaposi's sarcoma and of course, if they get into circulatory system, they can cause high blood pressure and heart diseases and may lead to death. Basically, nanoparticles influence cellular processes, example like proliferation, metabolism and death and as you know, cancer can result from uncontrolled cell proliferation. Neurodegenerative diseases are caused in part by premature cell death. It has been known that oxidative stress can cause many diseases like cardiovascular and neurological diseases, pancreatitis etcetera. So, we need to be careful when we introduce this nanotechnology. We need to assess the risk of having some nanotechnology risk in terms of its effect on environment, its effect on ecology and ultimately its effect on human health. So, to reduce the impact, if we prevent the entry of 
this nanoparticles into the environment, then we can reduce the impact. For example, if we utilize nanostructured materials in thin film form, then these nanostructured materials are firmly attached to a substrate. They do not pose a health risk as long as they do not detach from the substrate. Like some examples of this thin film form are silicon rugate filter, titanium pillars, copper pyramids, zinc oxide nanowires, porous silver, porous AG, porous silicon. These are some of the nanostructured materials in thin film form. Whereas, if we are utilizing free nanoparticles, they can become airborne very easily and as a result they pose a potential health risk. Like free nanoparticles are silicon rods, carbon black, silver, titanium dioxide, silicon zigzags, etcetera. So, if you are using these things in our technology, we need to do some risk assessment and then see how much are, what is the potential for them to become airborne and consequently pose a potential health risk. Next, I would like to discuss the internet and the environment or what is the impact of internet on environment. I ask this question because we use these computers so much these days, they are so ubiquitous. I ask this question, is my computer a global warming culprit? Because of these computers, how much greenhouse gases, the emission of greenhouse gases has increased? I ask a question, what is the effect of my internet surfing on the environment? All of us do so much of internet surfing, all of us use internet so much. How is it affecting the environment? Alex Weissner Gross of Harvard University in 2009, he has estimated that carbon emission from each Google risk, Google search. For each search, the carbon emission is not very much, but millions of searches, we are doing millions and billions of searches, they all total up to something. Each second of search, the emission of approximately 20 milligrams of CO2 and it is estimated that monthly logging on the internet is about 35 into 10 to the power of 9 minutes. That means, 42 million kg of CO2 is getting emitted, that is substantial. McAfee has found that electricity used up in sending trillions of spam mail over one year, spam mail over one year is equivalent to power needed to light up 20 lakh homes, 2 million homes. So, you can see what is the effect that internet is having on the environment. The global IT industry generates as much greenhouse gas as the world's airlines. Massive data centers and thousands of servers which are required running this internet, they require considerable amount of energy. In fact, Many of these internet giants are sensitive to this and they do, they take actions in terms of saving the energy. Google is supposed to have spent 1 billion dollars on renewable energy and they also design and operate the data centers in such a way that those centers use 50 percent less energy. You ask a question, how much electricity does the internet use? For example, physical internet, 1.6 billion connected PCs and notebooks are there, 6 billion mobile devices. Now, a PC uses 
200 kilowatt hour per year, notebooks 70 kilowatt hour per year, phones 25 watt hours and tablets 12 kilowatt hours. So, low power devices have 80 percent embedded energy. Now, this just to give you an idea on what is the power requirement, how much of power these devices are utilizing and then can we do something about it, can we save some power in this aspect. Like data centers, they use 1 to 2 percent of world's energy. So, if we move locally hosted services to large data centers, it is estimated that we may reduce energy cost by the internet by 87 percent. Of course, when we say these things, we also need to think about what are the positive aspects of internet or how internet can be used positively to increase the sustainability. So, we need to have some systems thinking. Yes, internet consumes electricity, but the use of internet may have a net environmental impact on the positive side. Somebody has given this example of downloading music is 40 to 80 percent less harmful as compared to buying a CD or we can use internet for operating parking lots in a smart way and then save the cost from increased fuel usage. So, when we talk about these effects, we have to think in a system, in a systems way that is what is the in overall what is the impact it is having. But then we also have to be sensitive about what we are doing with this e-waste, this internet and IT industry use of computers eventually generates a lot of electronic waste. Now, handling the electronic waste is not the same as handling other type of waste. For example, the food waste that comes out of our houses that is much easier to handle than handling this e-waste. So, what are we doing with this e-waste? Is it that it is out of our premises and it is out of our mind? where are we sending this, what are we doing with it. So, these are some of the questions we need to think about when we are utilizing internet. Thank you.